So Luke 15 is a just a fabulous chapter on the passion and the love of God, a seeking father, a seeking God who will never let up. He will stay after you. Whether you have given your life to Christ or not, he will stay after you. If you're in a state of falling away or backsliding, he'll stay after you. And so in Luke 15, there is the story of a lost sheep, a hundred sheep, lost sheep. Then there's the story of a lady losing, she has ten valuable coins, she loses one of those. And then there is the story of the son that gets lost to his family. And in all of those, they are the story of a seeking, loving God. But we're going to start, I think I'm just going to, well, I'll read the first seven verses, and then we're going to start in, because the first few verses are critical to our learning. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, and the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine, and in the open field, and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he places it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls out to all of his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, listen to this, folks, now, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner. You hear me? Over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. Jesus is making a statement here. Just one. I mean, you got a hundred. Who cares? But just one of those is valuable to him. And there's a message to the church in this, folks, that it is not about our comfort. Because what we ought to be about, God has done so much for us. God has taken care of us. But there are people out there who have never heard the story. There are people out there that don't know Christ. There are believers that have strayed away and they've given up and saying, I can't do it. God will... I spoke with one last week. And, and, and they said to me, would you pray for me? And I said, what would you like me to pray? Well, I don't know, just, you know how to pray, pray. See, some people don't have it all together. And I said, would you like to pray that you will know Christ and you'll be forgiven? Yeah, pray that. And when I got done praying, because they didn't know how to pray, when I got done praying, I said, what do you think? Do you believe what I said? Do you believe what I just prayed? And this person said, I don't know. You see, I've got so much anger and hurt in my life. I don't know who to trust. We have a story to tell. That Jesus can be trusted. That Jesus saves. That Jesus changes. You can trust Jesus. And so... He tells them that story. Our mission is to get one more. And, and you know, uh, this past week, I can't remember, one of, the, one of the preachers said, too often churches get into, and it's not a new saying, they get into themselves. we got to keep our little church clean. No, we don't. We've got to get our hands dirty. And we've got to get people in here. And this, this preacher said, us four and no more. <laughs> That's what a lot of churches are. It's comfortable now. I like it this way. And you know what? You were not called to comfort. You were called to Christ. And when you're called to Christ, it's out of your comfort and into the care of the lost one out there. And th this, this year, I was thinking over the number of people that the candle has been lit for that have accepted Christ. How exciting that is. And so we're going to look. I want to look. This is going to be part one of the lavish love of the Father. Lavish love. What's lavish? Do you know what lavish is? Abundant. Abundant. <clears throat> Luxurious. 
Oh, the luxurious, lavish, royal love of God. See, there's no comparison to it in the world, but please, please hear me and understand. If we don't have a concept of how great that love is, how are we going to tell the world the difference in this love? Because we've got a lot of throwing out the word love. I love you, man. Yeah, I know. I love you. It isn't that it's not meant, but the love of God is not like I love you, man. The love of God is I died for you, not I'm willing to. You know, if I said, I love you so much, I'd give my life for you. Jesus didn't say that. He did it. We have a story to tell. But I'm going to tell you what I think the problem is. Randy spoke about the love of God. I'm not speaking about that today. The lavish love of God has to be known and received by us first. We have to understand how much he loves us if we're going to share that message to others. So who is the audience here? We're going to go, we're going to go into that. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. So let's look at verse 1a. All the tax collectors and sinners. The tax collectors. Now in the King James it says publicans. So that's not republicans. Publicans. If it were publicans, if it were republicans, then the rest of it would fit too because it says the publicans and the sinners, so it would be the Republicans and the Democrats. They're all, they're all happy. Okay, that's a joke. It's okay. The publicans, it meant, it was a word, it meant a farmer of taxes, one who grows taxes. That sounds normal. So these tax collectors, why are they so separated? Why does it say, and by the way, it's a, like 22 times the word comes up, and it's almost always negative, the IRS and the FBI. Well, the tax collectors. <clears throat> Why doesn't he just say sinners? Well, first of all, he's wanting to depict something. The tax collectors were second in rank in the social system of Rome. And so they called it equestrian, equestrian rank. Now that usually means nowadays handling horses. But they were high up, actually, and even the Roman government kind of feared them and because of what they were like. They were hated because of the fraud and the greed and the harshness with what they operated with. Even other nations knew of the Jewish tax collectors. Now, well, stay away from those guys. So you have this upper rank, but they are really despised and feared. Well, then he says sinners. So you've got the tax collectors, and then he goes on and he says, sinners. Now, one of the interesting things is that I, I've got to say this. Not many of us want to be reminded of our past, right? We don't like to be reminded. We live with it sometimes. We forget that the past is under the blood because it comes up. And somebody, by the way, if you do get it buried, somebody will uncover it for you. So you better know how to deal with your past. You know how Matthew dealt with his past? What was Matthew, folks? A tax collector. So in Matthew 10, Matthew's got... Matthew, the tax collector, has the first gospel in the New Testament. There's hope for you. You never know how God is going to use you. Matthew, hated, despised, harsh, greedy. You know how Matthew... He lists all of the apostles, you know, Bartholomew and Peter and James and John. He goes through all that. And then he says, he lists himself. As, and Matthew, the publican, the tax collector. He literally attaches that title to himself. Why would a person put, I'm Matthew, I've been called by Christ, but I'm Matthew the tax collector, why would you hang on to that? Well, he's not. He is reminding people. Don't, don't feel great about yourself. 
feel great about him. Don't think that you earned your way into the cross. You didn't earn it. You know what Matthew is saying? If Jesus can change me, I'm the tax collector, Matthew, and now I'm an apostle. Oh, you have no idea what God might do in a life that is humble enough. So you see, the enemy wants to take your past and beat you over the head with it. And Matthew says, guess what, Satan? I'm an apostle that was a tax collector. Can you beat that? No. Oh, what a wonderful thing. And you know, it, it kind of it touched me this week. You see, that's why I like just digging into the verses. Because sometimes Satan, do, I know this is going to shock you, but he comes after me. And he'll remind me of what I've done. He'll say, you know, those people out there, if they knew everything about you, they'd probably change churches tomorrow. If they knew your sin. But even if that's not it, Satan will come at you sometimes and say, you're not that good. And you know, I used to argue with them. Don't waste much time arguing with Satan. In fact, I don't recommend talking to him unless it's just to tell him to get behind you. And you know what I can say to him? Satan, would you keep giving me the list? Tell me more. What's everything you've got against me? I'm Sam, a child of God. And everything you've got against me was nailed to that cross. My past, my present, my future was covered at that cross. I, I want you to know you're to walk right and have your mind renewed and, and become righteous in the righteousness of Christ. And, but but the faults or whatever goes wrong with you tomorrow, it's the same blood. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. The blood of Christ. It is there for me tomorrow. It's there for me next year. I was a sinner. And I was saved. Amen. By grace. So, I don't have to give you a great resume. He's my resume. Show me your papers, Sam. It's here. For God so loved the world. That's me. Okay. Tax collectors, Matthew. No problem. I'm, I'm Matthew the publican. Oh, that gets Satan mad. When you're not that anymore. <clears throat> Have you been transformed by the power of Christ. Well, so now we go to sinners. Good night, it can't get any worse than tax collectors. Well, it's not. Sinners. Now there, I, I really do want to go into this as part of our preparation for the chapter. Um, sinners, there is a word, hamartia, and that is the number one word. It's used maybe almost 300 times in the New Testament for sin. It's the main word for sin. And it can mean it in a number of ways. One of the things you can't do in Scripture is pick a certain word and know exactly with sin how it's meant unless it's in the context. Because hamartia can mean uh, anything short of the glory of God or perfection for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But it usually has the connotation of a nature and rebellion. It is an act against God. We are all born with a sin nature. So you say, well, he says tax collectors and sinners. And here's where it's going to get a, a, a little deeper. Well, aren't we all sinners, Sam? No, we are not. I'm sorry. We are not labeled sinners. We are labeled saints. We are labeled the church of God. We are labeled children of the Most High. We are labeled priests, a royal priesthood. That is what you are labeled. That's, but that's why 
there is a difference in a person with a new nature. When you accept Christ into your heart and you confess your sins, you should be given a new nature. And what that means is this. Your desire is now to live right. Your desires change. When you are a sinner, your desires are yourself. Let's just call it self. I'll have my fun. Nobody's going to tell me what I can do. Isn't this great? Oh, I put one over on that guy. Yes, I managed to slip that tax return in. No. When you're a sinner, you don't care. It's your nature. Let me put it to you this way. When you are a sinner, that's your identity, then... You might do some good things. Did you know there are sinners that do really good things? But it is not your nature. It's just that you do good things. Your nature is a sinner. When you give your life to Christ and you're serious about that and you believe Him and you start walking with Him and He's your Father and Jesus is your brother, now you're given a new nature and your nature is to live righteously. But you may sin. I want you to know every saint has the potential to sin. We sin. But I also want you to know that the scripture is loaded to say, My little children, I write to you that you sin not. I said, Jesus, in numerous cases, to the woman in adultery, Go and sin no more. To the man that was crippled at the pool that he healed. Leave your life of sin, lest the worst thing come upon you. Now you've got a new nature. Some denominations would argue that. I believe it says you no longer walk in the flesh, you walk in the spirit. But you have a will, so you can sin. But I want to tell you, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you ask Him to come into your heart, and you're serious about living for Him, then you are a saint, and that's what Paul calls every single church, to the saints in Philippi, to the saints in Corinth, to the saints every They're saints. Doesn't mean they're perfect. But their love is being perfected. Perfect love is not perfect performance. But you can have a love for God that begins to change your performance. Why? Because real love does that. When you get married, you make a decision, hopefully, that other loves, other relationships are left behind. And I want <coughs> to love and please God. Just like a marriage, when you give your life to Christ, you become his bride. Do you know how precious that is? I am tired of a culture that tells the church they can't help but sin. We may sin. That is not the message of the gospel. Now I'm going to get into some things of Jesus preaching very tough, tough stuff. We'll get to it. People are afraid today to preach the tough stuff. You think you can live any way you like. Go out and have all the pleasure you want. And still be a disciple of Christ. If any man will be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up a cross, and follow me. Go and leave a life of sin. Now, but John is so good. John says, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. There will be sins of the saints. There will be. There will be sinning saints. But it's a different kind of thing. You know what that really is? Before I really cared about what people or Jesus thought, well, it was no big deal. If I sinned, well, I got by. I'm young. I'll turn it all over when I'm older. I'm going to enjoy myself now. I didn't feel badly. There was no conviction. I was just, well, I'm as good as that guy. You always compare yourself to somebody else. Well, I'm not as bad as them. Don't do that, church. That's called Pharisees. 
Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Compare yourself to what Christ has called you to be, not to somebody else. Jesus humbled himself and emptied himself of everything and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. But you know the difference right now? I have sin in my life at times, folks. I'm sorry, is that, is that okay to announce here? I sin. I just said that we shouldn't be sinning. I sin at times. I'll get a little bit more into definition and I'm not trying to water it down. But I'll tell you what, when I sin, I don't go, no big deal. It breaks my heart. It doesn't have to be a big sin. So we're going to talk about some of the, But the sinners were coming to Jesus. These were harlots, prostitutes. These were drunks. These were the behaviorally the Pharisees. They only had two classes, the Pharisees, by the way. You only had two classes in Jesus' day in the religious establishment. The righteous and the unclean. And yet Jesus told the Pharisees, you're more unclean than anybody. You look good on the outside. You're like a tomb that's been painted white. Whoo, isn't that a pretty tomb? You know what's in it? Bones. Dead men's bones. He says to the religious leaders, I can call them sinners, but I want to tell you guys something. You've got things going on in you that is worse. Oh, I'll give you the scripture for I'm not making this up. That is worse than those people out there. Oh God, keep me from arrogance. Keep me from pride of me. May I boast only in the cross. Because without him I am nothing. And without him I can do nothing. So don't think if you've been a Christian two years, five years, ten years. Well, I'm so much better than they. No. You have just found a place in the family where God is changing and working on you. And except for the grace of God and the cross, you are no different than what's out there. Sinners. Let's just take a look for a moment, because I do want to clarify this. The sins of the saints. There are different words. You should not be in rebellious sin. I'm going to tell you right now, my sin isn't this, as a believer. My sin is not to, I get up in the morning, well, I think it would be a good day to cheat on my wife. I'm going to go sin. Well, this would be a good day to uh, rob a bank. You know, I am, m the type of sin that I do is not my nature. I'm going to go and party and see what I can do. I don't, that's not the way I sin. There are different kinds of sin for believers. <clears throat> One of the biggest is, again, pride, arrogance. Now, but let's look at some others biblically. So, James 5.16 says, and this isn't to water down, confess your faults. This is talking to believers. Confess your faults one to another. By the way, it doesn't say confess Eddie's faults. It says confess my faults to Eddie. I don't confess Eddie's faults to the church. I confess my faults. Let's start there. The psalmist said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit in me. Now the word for faults, paraptoma, paraptoma, it is Basically, it has this meaning. It is a side slip, a lapse, a deviation, and usually unintentional. It's not intentional. It's a fault. Listen to this. Nobody can forgive your sins but God. No man, no priest, no minister. I cannot forgive your sins. If you sin, you really rebel against God... You cheat, you do whatever, and you come to say, will you forgive me? I can forgive a fault, but only God can forgive sins because all sin is against God. It's not against Sam. If you do something terrible to me, you need to confess it to God if you want sin forgiven. That's why James doesn't say confess your sins one to the other. Now, it's okay. 
This word paraptoma can mean a sin, but that is not the usual context. It means unintentional, I deviated, I missed the mark. Actually, you know what a fault would be? Well, you know, I was going to use this illustration. Oh, she's here. She's not with the children. <laughs> I was going to say, a fault, a fault would be, my wife left my shirts in the dryer too long and they're all wrinkled. Why did you do that? You messed up. But the reality is really this. You want to know what a real fault is? Finding fault. Finding fault with other people. Did you know it's so much easier to nitpick? You know what Jesus said to the religious leaders? The Pharisees? He said, you strain gnats. You ever done that? You ever, you ever had a drink outside especially? All of a sudden there's a little bug in there. You go, you go to your hood. And you pick it out and you go. Phew. Okay, he didn't drink much. And that's okay. <laughs> you strain gnats. But you swallow camels. Do you get the picture? This is the same Jesus that said, you have got a two-by-four in your eye and you're trying to take a splinter out of somebody else's eye. I don't want that surgeon. Get the plank out of your eye. Faults. It's noticing the shortcomings of others is a fault. Now, confessing my fault. I'm going to tell you, there are times I'm not as sensitive to what's going on in a person as I need to be. And when the Holy Spirit brings that to my mind, I, I am like, oh my goodness. Or a person asks me a question, and I later think, you know, my answer was pretty frivolous. You know, one of, the, one of the things that can be a fault, listen to me very carefully, because these aren't hard, they're not mean. They're not mean, but they can start to tear a life up. Someone says, you know, you go to a funeral, and, and, and somebody has lost an important person, a father, a spouse, a child. And the first thing that comes out of your mouth is not, I'm sorry, you go, oh, well, I'm... Aren't you glad they're in heaven? No, they're not right then. That's not the first thing on their mind. They miss them. My, I knew that my dad was going to heaven. I knew that my mom was going to heaven. All I needed was someone to say, I'm sorry, not well, we know where they're at. Yeah, I know where they're at. They're not with me right now. We need to have feelings to understand where people are at. And it's a fault to just use your Christianese to blow somebody's pain off. You need to feel their pain. And yes, it's wonderful to say, oh, I know I'll see them again, but you know what? I'll tell you the truth, folks. I can tell you the truth. I would love to see my dad now. I'd love to see him one more time. Give me one afternoon. I'd love to see my mom sing one more song with her guitar. I'd love to. That's my feelings. But my faith says we'll be singing in heaven. But I still miss them every once in a while. It just comes fresh like it happened yesterday. That's because God made you and I relational. We have relationships. And what Jesus, you know why the sinners came to him? And we'll get to that someday. They came to him. Why was Jesus attractive to the sinners and tax collectors? Would you look at the word in there? And all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to him. I haven't seen that happen with many people. All. The word pas in the Greek. That gets us to our next part. So the tax collectors and sinners were approaching 
they were drawing near. Oh, let me just give you a couple other categories. I did, I did miss those. Confess your faults, that's one. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here we are again. He doesn't use the word sin. He's going to talk about two different kinds of things. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know what a debt is? Something that is owed. And I want to tell you something about that. If you... What is owed? Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. So actually, folks, according to Jesus, if I'm a disciple, I owe you love, and you owe me love. And so I have a debt, and you're my debtor. But you know what? Life is not perfect. People may not love you the way you know that they should or wish they would. And you're loving people. And Jesus is saying, you know, if you love on people and they don't give it back to you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to know that I will forgive your debts. What you owe me. I will forgive your debts if you'll forgive the debts of others. I'm going to tell you right now, there are people that didn't give us what we needed in life. It might have been family. There are spouses that don't give you what you need or what you think you need. They're a debtor. But this is the hard part of Christianity. When someone doesn't love you, you know what you're supposed to do? Of course you do. You love them anyway. You love them anyway. You see, this is not a tit-for-tat exchange. Do unto others as they do. It's as you would have them do. I want you to treat them as you would like to be treated, not as you are. So debts. Jesus says, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then a couple verses later in that same Matthew 6, Lord's Prayer, look it up yourself. It'll say offenses or trespasses. So he uses the word of James. He says, if you don't forgive the trespasses of someone else, then your father is not going to forgive your trespasses. So here's the thing. I need to give you forgiveness all the time. I need to forgive the debts that you owe me, no matter what it was. And I need to forgive your trespasses. I can't forgive your sins, that's against God. But I can forgive your trespasses, what you do to me. I can forgive your debts, what I think you owed me that you didn't give me. You know, you, didn't, you just don't give me enough attention. They notice everybody else in the church, but they don't notice me. You need to forgive that stuff. That'll tear you up. So Jesus said, hey, you forgive others' trespasses, and guess what? I will forgive you. You can walk around trespass-free, debt-free. Now, those are categories of sins of the saints. Jesus doesn't use the word sin one time in the Lord's Prayer. Even though they can have a connotation of sin because we can't forgive each other's sin. But we sure can look at faults and go, it's okay, Lord. There's an old song that I just remember the title to. He looked, how many remember? He looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous this grace that caught my falling soul. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. Aren't you glad that Jesus looked beyond what you were? Amen. Okay. So let's just go to the middle of that verse. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching him. So here's the deal. They had an interest in him, 
They were approaching. It means drawing near. In the Greek, when you really dig into some of the words, the root words, it's as if to take by the hand to pull in. There's two words like that in, the, in this passage. And so they are approaching. They are coming to him. They are drawing near to join. They're joining him. In Luke 14, I told you that Jesus preached really tough stuff. But that did not turn these people off. How can tough preaching attract them to Jesus? You know, I better preach really soft stuff about morals. Because I want to I wanna get people to come. Wouldn't it be something if the truth would set people free? Not some milk toast, whitewashed, so-called gospel of love. The gospel of Jesus' love is about truth and honesty, who you are and what you need. It's not about covering over your sin. Oh, this is such good news. I had a friend, I don't want to say too much in case... She watches this. Maybe I'm about to sin. I'm not sure. No, I have a friend that didn't, didn't, um, if she didn't have time to take a bath or a shower, she just sprayed on more perfume. It was kind of a perfume bath. Perfume might be a cover of odor, but it's not a cleansing. Jesus didn't come to cover over your sin. Oh, he hid it. I know we say he buried it in the deepest sea, but it says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. He buries your sin. You see, when you take a bath, oh, I take a shower. When you take a shower or a bath, the old, the water, the dirt goes down the drain and out of sight. But you're not looking clean, you are clean. You're not called clean, you're made clean. Jesus doesn't cover over, he cleanses from sin. They drew near to him, and they were attracted. Here, it's just this. They drew near, let's look at it. They were approaching, and what were they approaching for? To listen to him. Now, I could speak a long time, so I have to quit now. I could speak a long time on this, so I'll come back and wrap this up as we start into the narratives. They came, they were, who were they approaching? Who is it talking about? To listen to him. Jesus. Jesus, right? They came near to listen to to him. They didn't come to listen to the Pharisees. They didn't come to even listen to religious instructions. They came to him. I, I, I'll just, I'll close with this today because it's just way too much to go on. <laughs> you know why you should come to church? To listen to him. You know why I should come to church? To listen to Him. Do you want to know what's attractive? It's not how big our sign is outside. It's not the decor of this building. That's nice. You want to know what attracts people? Jesus. Jesus. They were coming to listen to Him. I want to hear Him. I, listen, I, don't, I, I want you to hear Him in my messages. I can give messages without Christ or the Holy Spirit. I can. I, I did speeches in school. You can give speeches. You can become a motivational speaker. I, I loved it, debate back then. I don't think I ever won any really, but I liked debating. It's a terrible thing. It's one of my faults. Do you know what they put on my graduation picture of the yearbook? You know they have those sayings underneath? 
Do you know what was mine? This is my legacy from high school. Give him time and by his might he'll prove to you that black is white. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's, what, that's my reputation. Because when the elections came out, I'd play this presidential candidate. And I love debate. And I didn't care which side. I just, you know, okay, I'll take the part I don't like. And there are great speakers around the world today, but they are not him. The internet is full of great teaching and preaching, but it's not him. And, and it, will, it will engage people, but only him will change people. Some speakers will make you feel good, but he will make you good. Amen. You need him. So let's wrap up our... We got through half a verse today. It's okay. <laughs> and the tax collectors... That's me. I was harsh. I've been greedy. And the sinners. I've had moral failures more than my share. That's me. I'm a tax collector. I'm a sinner. I have hope in him. Here's what I don't want to be. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Jesus, you are 